Foreign Minister Gibran Basile, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. How far has the killing of the Jordanian pilot Kasazbi transformed the fight against ISIL, Daesh, in the region? It is a new way of killing, but eventually it's one of a series of uh, hostilities against the humanity. And uh, as for us in Lebanon, we have lost uh, tens or hundreds of uh, martyrs in our army. And this is a fight that we have to take it to the end by eradicating Daesh, not only containing it. And this is the most fear that we have about this battle. After the killing of the pilot, your Prime Minister Tamam Salam wrote to King Abdullah of Jordan expressing his sympathy. He also said, this dark plague that has ravaged our region calls for a stand that is up to the challenge of terrorism. Do you believe that the region is up to that challenge? Yes, but I don't know if the whole world is up to it. It's feeling the urgency that we cannot deal with it at uh, uh, a pace of years. Because in Lebanon, we have now 25 uh, hostages as soldiers. We have hundreds of people who are being killed. Uh, look what's happening in Europe. Look what happened with the Japanese. So uh, we are dealing here with an ideology that has no limits, no boundaries. It can be transmitted very quickly to any dormant cell, any, any place in the world. So I guess that this is much more ur urgent than we are dealing with it. You are part of the Free Patriotic Movement in Lebanon, led by your father-in-law, the veteran Lebanese general, uh, politician General Michel Aoun. Now, that is in alliance with Hezbollah, which is backed by Iran. You've got the Arab states, which are, for the most part, Sunni. And so how can you sit at the same table as them when you are really effectively on different sides? But we are sitting on the same table in a national unity government in Lebanon. And we are all together, Sunni, Shias, and Christians, fighting against uh, Daesh with a unified Lebanese armed forces. And our martyrs are all from uh, all religions and uh, confessions. So this is a fight that has no religion, that has no place. And there might be differences in how aggressive people and countries are in the region. There are some, some of them are ready to be the boots on the ground without any condition. Some of them are having some uh, uh, hesitation about it. But you are part of a party, a member of a party, which has as its ally Hezbollah, and we know that there are fighters from Hezbollah fighting alongside President Bashar al-Assad of Syria's forces. And he, of course, is not supported by major Arab states like Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. Doesn't that put you in an awkward position? Not at all, because we are all fighting one enemy, which is Daesh. The um, Lebanese writer, broadcaster, journalist, Iyad Abu Shakra says, Gibran Basile is a friend of the regime in Syria and is proud to defend and regard it as a political ally. Are you comfortable with that? I'm, I'm defending my country, which is Lebanon. When we had to fight Syria, when it occupied Lebanon, we were the only ones who had the courage to fight Syria. And now that Syria is uh, with its army within Syria, this is something that we leave for the Syrian people to decide about it. What I care about is my country, its independent sovereignty, and not to have the spillover effects coming from Syria. But you know, Lahda Brahimi, the former UN and Arab League envoy to Syria, said on BBC Radio this week, if countries in the region start talking seriously and try to help Syria, that may work. Or if they start looking at their national interests, Syrians will suffer and there will be ripple effects in the region. So actually, you just saying, all I care about is Lebanon, is short-sighted, according to Mr. Brian. No, it is, it is me as a foreign minister of Lebanon. Of course, on my top priority is the safety and the stability and peace in Lebanon. Then there is something interfering in it in, within Syria is something harming Syria and the Syrian people. So I can wish things Who's to happen. Who's harming the Syrian people? I can wish things to happen in Syria. We can all wish the best for Syria, for the democracy, but we have to know when, when to, to interfere and when not to interfere. And I guess that the 
foreign interventions within Syria has complicated the matter, and it's no more a purely Syrian nor even a regional uh, right. conflict. You, you say, obviously, you're the foreign minister, and then, obviously, your relations with other countries is uh, key to what you do. So, again, I ask you whether you are comfortable with your support of President Assad. He has said, for instance, very flattering things about the leader of your party, Michel Aoun. He describes him as an honourable and honest man who has remained loyal to his stance towards us despite all the storms. Are you, are you happy being in that situation, I'm, I'm, that position? I'm very happy supporting the choice of the Syrian people. It's not up to me. And Bashar al-Assad is the nor, choice nor, of the Syrian no, people? No, it's up to the Syrians to decide who is their choice. I'm only fighting Daesh now. And it's not a matter of uh, uh, being in comfort with the person or with the regime. It's up to the choice. To the, you, you know, we in Lebanon, we suffered from uh, the choices of the others uh, in our national, you know, uh, directions. So it's not, we, we learned a lot from this. And we don't want to interfere in others' uh, uh, affairs. So this is something that we leave to the Syrians. And we deal with whoever is governing Syria. But definitely, so you just turn a blind me eye and all to... other foreign ministers, mm -hmm. we agree on something that Daesh is a threat and is the main threat that we have to deal with. But, you know, you, you say you just leave Syrians to what's going on, uh, you know, you leave them to the oppression, the killing that's going on in their country. I mean, Stefan de Mistura, the current UN envoy to Syria, has said that the Syrian people have suffered more than any other since the Second World War. Two million refugees, six million internally displaced. They're being attacked, killed by Syrian government forces. Does that, that not trouble you? Yeah, what troubles me most is that seeing 98 churches being demolished in one year in Syria, uh, tens of mosques being, being destroyed and people being killed in Syria and in Iraq but the same terrorist groups like Daesh just for their beliefs. So this you condemn killings by the, the from, extremists from, but not by no, from, Syrian government from forces? From any, any terror, you know, it's a war. And any violent way of killing people is condemned by us, definitely. Do you condemn the use of... Um, barrel bombs, these are steel drums full of shrapnel and explosives which the United Nations says it is well documented that President Bashar al-Assad's forces are using these to kill indiscriminately hundreds of civilians. No, we, we refuse any use of excessive force. Including barrel and this bombs. Is, uh, including everything. And this is why we have to stop the war in Syria. And this is why the effort should be made to have a political solution, which is the normal uh, end of a war. I ask you again about the use of barrel bombs by President Assad. He was asked in a BBC interview whether he used them. He denied that, but the British Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond said uh, President Assad is, a, is deluded or lying when he says his military are not murdering hundreds of innocent civilians with the use of barrel bombs. Is he using barrel bombs? I, I, it is up to, you know, the, uh, any UN investigation committee to say what's happening in Syria. I don't advocate what Bashar al-Assad said or what, uh, what any other foreign official said. What matters for us is to stop the killing in Syria from both sides. And of course, to, from both to, sides, uh, but how can you support one side we're that not, is killing? We're not supporting any side. <laughs> Our clear position in the government and in my party is not to interfere in Syrian affairs, to dissociate Lebanon from Syria and to uh, stop the fire from reaching our, our country. But th we have to accept that the Syrians had their experience with Bashar al-Assad, with Daesh and with the free army and any moderate uh, so-called opposition. So let them choose what they want. But President Assad told the BBC's uh, Middle East editor, Jeremy Bowen, we took the decision to fight terrorism from the very beginning. The so-called moderate opposition in Syria is a fantasy, a pipe dream. Even the West is accepting that now. Do you believe that Arab states should put aside their opposition to President Assad and fight with him against the extremists because you see them as the greater evil? Nobody should fight with anybody who refuses to join him. The, the thing is that in our uh, Arab League pact, 
uh, it's uh, well stated in Article 8 that no one Arab country should interfere in the internal affairs of another Arab country. So if any Arab state feels that Daesh is a danger, they should fight da Daesh their own way. So we don't have to join people who dislike each other. But if we all believe that Daesh is the main threat, so this is what should be our first you priority. You say don't interfere, but you know, we've got Arab countries that are part of the coalition, which are, uh, even Arab countries carrying out air operations against targets in Syria. And why, why, why not having also ground operations every, everywhere possible no. where we don't, we don't, you know, uh, touch to the sovereignty of a country and we would be much more efficient. But I don't understand how you say that and yet on the other hand you are allied with a, a group, a political group and militant group for some people, Hezbollah in Lebanon, who are actually fighting alongside President Assad's forces. That's a clear interventionist policy which you must either accept or condemn. No, it's actually we have an understanding with Hezbollah about uh, uh, Lebanon and the defense of, of Lebanon. And we don't have an understanding on their actions in Syria. Now, nevertheless, we so you have... you don't support their actions no, in Syria? We don't, we don't support the action of any uh, Lebanese faction in Syria because we have Lebanese from all sides interfering in Syria, militarily, politically, financially. So we don't support this at all. But we also have to admit that there is a threat coming from Syria towards, Luba, uh, towards Lebanon and Jabhat al-Nusra actions and Daesh and every Lebanese who is willing and fighting Daesh to stop the threat from coming to Lebanon, you have to support each other in Lebanon against the threat. But aren't the actions Hezbollah fighters fighting alongside Syrian government forces making life more difficult for Lebanon because the Sunni extremists now say they are justified in attacking Lebanon. So Hezbollah, your ally, is actually causing instability in your country. You know, I, I think there is no justification for why Daesh is doing what, what it's doing, nor for Hezbollah, nor for Maliki, nor for Assad, nor for the Israeli aggressions. Uh, nothing can justify uh, political frustration or uh, uh, political uh, oppression cannot justify the existence of a project like Daesh. So I think this is where we are not focusing on how to ideologically deal with Daesh. This is how we give, you know, uh, uh, the distraction on how to fight Daesh. The justification is not helpful because Daesh existed, you know, way, bef way before we lost a first uh, uh, official from the Lebanese army in 2000. He was decapitated. When, 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 when we were at that time about Hezbollah or Maliki, Maliki did not even exist. You're talking about Nouri al-Maliki. So terrorism, Prime Minister terrorism in existed Iraq. in Lebanon sure. and, uh, and in, the, in the region way before all this. So let's not justify it, please. No, but I was putting to you the fact that Hezbollah's stand in the conflict in Syria is heightening sectarian tensions in your country and actually encouraging the extremists to carry out attacks inside Lebanon. You know, this tension started between Sunnis and Shias 1,400 years ago. We and, can't go and back all yeah, that way. Yeah, 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 it's a, it's a reality. And uh, I know now the lines of tension in the region and the confrontation is, is getting closer. And this closer is to Lebanon? Closer to Lebanon. How much of the danger? Closer to Lebanon and closer to Syria. Okay. And closer to Iraq and closer to Yemen and to Saudi Arabia. How much? And, and it's a long line, you know, that we should know how to turn it into a line of understanding and dialogue instead of, of fighting. And this is why we want Hezbollah and any other Lebanese faction to stick to our official policy of the government and to stick into defending Lebanon and not So trying you are saying now to Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, he should not be supporting Assad forces in Syria. Is I'm, that what you're saying I'm, quite I'm, clearly? I'm, I'm, I'm saying that we should defend Lebanon. 
Okay, every party. So you, you're let avoiding me tell you, answering every, that question. Every party in Lebanon, you know, has his uh, right to express. This is the freedom of expression in, in Lebanon to believe and to support. What I'm saying is that our official uh, policy is to defend Lebanon, not to intervene in others' affairs. Okay, Very I, I, I had made the point to you that the actions of Hezbollah are exacerbating the situation, the tensions in Lebanon. How much of a threat are Daesh or ISIL to Lebanon, and if so, where in the country? Everywhere. There is no place uh, in Lebanon where uh, we did not have suicide bombers, uh, which were stopped sometimes by our services, military services, sometimes by Hezbollah. And they attacked places where the affiliation of the people are with Hezbollah and places for Christians or for Sunnis. Abbas Ibrahim, the head of Lebanon's general security office, has estimated that as many as 700 fighters from less extreme groups, Sunni groups, have pledged allegiance to ISIL, Daesh, swelling its ranks in Lebanon to about 1,000. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, it's possible. But you know what's dangerous about it? Is to have only one Lebanese, a society like the moderate Lebanese society, from all sides to... We would have never imagined that we will have Lebanese joining uh, Daesh. I get the same is for Sweden or for, well, it's not quite uh, for the same England. Because, and because Imam Salmi, who's a professor at Lebanon's American University, said in October last year that Sunnis in Lebanon are reacting to Shias supporting Damascus, Shia groups like Hezbollah, and are defecting to ISIL. And, you know, there's one example, Umar Khalid Shamti announced in October he was joining Nusra Front, which is an extremist group not quite ISIL, but th the reasons why some people are joining the extremist groups is because they see what the Shia groups are doing. Yeah, you know, and I think that many Sunnis are uh, also, if you look in Lebanon and Syria and in any other Lib uh, Arab country, Sunnis are also fighting against Daesh. And uh, they are much more numerous. Uh, and these are the Sunnis that we should encourage. The conflict in Syria, as we know, has resulted in 2 million Syrian refugees. 1.1 million have gone to Lebanon. And you have moved in recent months to tighten the, the flow of refugees into Syria, uh, into Lebanon from Syria. Why have you done that? Because these are desperate people who are fleeing the killing. You know, 200,000 have been killed in Syria at least you know we opened our borders and our hearts for the syrians for three years and we reached our our bearing capacity we cannot take any more especially i'm not uh, talking about humanitarian cases where definitely lebanon we will never close our doors to anyone in need from syria but can you imagine having... Is that, is that for sure? You'll never close the door from anybody in who, need? Who, because is in, who is in real need? But how humanitarian, do you, But aren't they all in security. need? Security. No, they are not. They are not. Believe me, it's not uh, wise to encourage the Syrians to leave Syria. Let me tell you that... It's not wise to encourage the Syrians to leave Syria, to, but to they don't want to uh, leave. No, They're no, fleeing let, the let, killing, let me, the barrel yeah, bombs, the let, attacks. Let, let, let me tell you, you know, not in every place in Syria there are now fights and people are still fleeing for economical reasons. So what we should do is encourage the Syrians to go back to the calm regions in Syria where life there can be in, in dignity and, and safety. So you're going and to turn them me, away? And, and, and You'll turn you. them away because there are six million internally displaced people inside Syria. That tells you that there are not many safe areas in the country. And then here you are saying they're going to turn up and you're going to be turning them away and telling them to go back, go no, to safe parts of Syria. Is that what you're saying? No, no, not at all. Because we never refuse one Syrian who is in need. But when reaching 150 Syrians per square kilometer, it is equivalent, you know, to having all Romanians and Bulgarians coming at once to the United Kingdom. Well, it's not quite it the is, same, because there aren't barrel bombs being dropped by yeah, the Romanian but, but government on God, their God, remaining God, citizens. God, God forbids, for any reason, you know, that you are put in a situation... But it's not where, comparable, is it, Minister? It's not comparable to say it's the same it's, as it's, Romanians it, it is, and Bulgarians it is a matter, coming in. You know, it's a matter of bearing 
uh, economically, socially, for security also, it's very deteriorating for the Syrians and for the Lebanese and for the sake of but the stability in the country. So no, no one, you know, uh, can bear to have this, uh, this um, influx of people who are, in many cases, don't fit the criteria set by the uh, 1951 Geneva Convention, where a refugee, you know, who is able to go back to his country is no more considered as a Half refugee. Half of these refugees are children, yeah. Minister. Half of them are children. We are really coming from with Syria them. into and Lebanon. We, we are giving are them, these really economic migrants? You know, we are giving them all the children education. You know, now, now the number of Syrian students in our schools is exceeding the number of the Lebanese students, and they are welcome. Nobody and they, denies you've and done they are a getting, lot. You you've know, done a lot. Nobody is, denies I that. I think Lebanon is a model of generosity. Of course. We cannot, you know, yeah. make Lebanon uh, take all this burden alone. It is a 10,000 square kilometer. You've received uh, millions country. of dollars, hundreds of millions no, of dollars no, in help no, from no, the international community. No, we received community, only as a direct aid, less than $100 million. Mm -hmm. Since four years, less than $100 million, where we are paying only per month more than $100 million for electricity to the Syrians. So are you now saying that unless you get more help, you're going to no, turn no, away? No, we're not. Because that's what you're saying, because there are now, you know, you're going to turn them away. They have to demonstrate that they have a clear purpose for going into Lebanon. They may just get a visa for six months, which has to uh, keep on being renewed. And the United Nations is concerned. They want to make sure that you're not going to be turning away vulnerable people. And then, then this uh, what about is the mobility dialogue here in the uh, uh, European Union? Is it not uh, the right of every country, you know, to take the measures to make sure that non-refugees are not coming uh, to take the jobs of the Lebanese, to take the places of the Lebanese in the economy. And to, do we have the interest to, ma to let the Lebanese flee their country? But you need because, to ensure because that, Because a yes. country, you know, a country cannot take more than 100, as if you are talking of England taking 200 million people in three years. This is the same density, you know, of people that we have exceeded. So, no one, no real refugee is refused from coming into Lebanon. Nadim Houri, the Middle East Director of Human Rights Watch, says the authorities have presented no evidence that curfews for Syrian refugees are necessary. There are 45 municipalities across the country that have imposed curfews on the Syrian refugees. And he says that this is just contributing to an increasingly hostile environment for Syrian refugees no, in know, Lebanon. That's not acceptable, no, it, is it, it Minister? In some cases, it is to reduce the tension, caring for the Syrians, for their security, and for ours. It is a way to uh, uh, try to avoid any kind of, ca of tension and yielding to violence between Syrians themselves or between Syrians and Lebanese. And this is where we are saying we have reached a, a, a level where we should take care of not creating another turbulent environment in Lebanon like in Syria. So you're saying that the S Lebanese people could turn against the Syrians no, everybody, in their uh, midst, everybody, the conflict? The Syrians are turning against each other. And the but Lebanese could the Lebanese are turn against the Syrians because you say they're coming in, taking their jobs and that kind of, of thing? Of course. They could? Yes, of course. Foreign Minister Gibran Basile, thank you very much indeed for coming on thank Hard you. Talk. Thank you. Thank you.